Good afternoon, I'm Jeremy Rundle, freelance NUJ journalist. Slandistel and surrounding news. David Llewellyn, as you know, is the Police and Crime Commissioner for the David Powis Police Force area. I first interviewed him after he had been in post for six months and now after three and a half years I thought it about time to catch up with him and find out how he was doing. Last time when we met, which was about three years ago, yeah, roughly yeah, three years yeah, ago. Least probably more actually, about three and a half years about ago. About three and a half years. Right at the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah. It was. Um, how <clears> long <throat> do you stay in post? Yeah, so it's a four year term of office and the next election for the Police and Crime Commission is on, it's, it, well, it's scheduled to be on the 7th of May. Uh, scheduled on the 7th of May this year. Oh, so, right. So it's literally within eight weeks or so. Right. Um, obviously, it's a little bit up in the air in relation to the coronavirus at the moment because there's the question mark over whether ha holding an election is wise if the virus is still spreading, etc. But but at the moment, they've they've not said anything, have they? That's the point. So, yeah. so at the moment, it's the 7th of May. Uh, it's a four-year term in office, so that would be the conclusion of my four years. Um, and I'm standing again, others are standing again, uh, or standing, sorry, um, from, from different parties. Yeah. I'm expecting that all the parties will be represented because that's the way democracy works. And, you know, it'll be up for the public to decide whether they think I've done a relatively good sort of show of it or not. You so know, after the elections, when does it get decided and how? So the election... The, the handover. Yeah, the, a, the actual election is on the 7th of May. The count is on the Monday after that, whatever that date is. And then the transfer is on the following Wednesday night into the Thursday morning. So Thursday is the first day that the new commissioner or that I return for another term in office, it'll be the Thursday that there's that handover. Right. So it's it's quite quick, really. So I'll know on the Monday yeah. whether I've got a job on Thursday or not. That's how it works. Um, so you don't go to any other part of the police force? That, no. That is it? That is it, yeah. So if I don't win the election in May and, you know, on that Monday, the count goes elsewhere in the sense that, you know, another party or another person wins uh i will literally be out of work on midnight of the wednesday oh well so we better keep our fingers <laughs> we better we better keep our fingers crossed well i'm working very hard so well whether that's sufficient who knows my first question has changed slightly yep with the possibility of a virus and we're not just talking coronavirus now any any virus, any virus yeah, now yeah. that's come to light where does the police force stand now on staffing levels? Yep. Do you have sufficient staff to keep in your fingers crossed to man 999, 101, frontline staff, etc.? And if you do, where do they come from? Yeah, so the, what would happen in effect was that, is that um, certain measures would be put in place to try and ensure that we have as much resources working as possible. So as you would imagine, because policing is a 24-7 service, you have people who are on rest days, as they're referred to, or even on annual leave. So what the force can do in a what would be deemed to be a critical incident environment, they would cancel leave, for example. So where people have got annual leave currently scheduled maybe for the Easter holidays, being as that might be where, you know, some, it could, in the current circumstance of coronavirus, mm -hmm might be the sort of peak point of it, it, that it, it there is a, a real possibility that the force would just cancel any leave. So by cancelling leave, that obviously provides you with a greater resilience of staffing. The other thing to um, ensure is that individuals are able to work remotely. So we're already talking about some of the senior managers of the organisation working remotely, staying sort of confined to a degree to their homes and using technology. Can you do that? Yeah, we can. So you, we've got You yourself? I could do that. I could work from home most of the time. I've got access to my emails, I've got access to the phone line, I've got Skype, I've got, you know, all of the technology that's needed really. What we would have to also do is just basically cancel all non-essential meetings, uh, conferences, uh, all of the things that aren't necessarily a, a significant sort of level of priority we would just prioritize the work that the force does so we would obviously be prioritizing 909 calls 
uh, prioritising the seriousness of, 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 of incidents. But the other added part of it, I suppose, is the, the work that the force have to do, the work the force have to do um, to support any confinement of the public. So if, the for, if, na in, if nationally the, we go into a stage of containment, yes. which is the next phase of it, where we're, where we're basically telling people to restrict travel, especially those who have been suspected of having the virus or contaminate, being contaminated in any way, then there's an onus on the force, potentially, police force, to to um, uh, to ba well, basically uh, be the ones to enforce any legislation. And I'm led to believe this week there will be emergency legislation coming out of Westminster that gives that authority to that the police That was on the news today as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. So uh, have we got all the resources that we need? I think I think we would would do the best we can in the circumstances, working with partner agencies. We could always do with more resources. And in particular, I've, I've made a point in a statement, actually, about resources. And what I meant by that was not necessarily the human resources, but some of the additional resources around the masks, um, the um, ways in which you can sort of sanitise and, 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 and also deep clean areas as well. So what we're... Which I would assume is important for things like police cars and police, oh, yeah, police vans. Yeah, definitely, and also for police headquarters itself. Yeah. So where we got our operations room, where we take all the 999 calls on 101, we've got a contingency for anything, if anything happens for that, which is at another location where we could set up an, another 999. We can also brigade our calls across to South Wales, Gwent or North Wales. The technology allows us to do that. So if you can't get an answer... Um, you know, through the, the traditional lines. There's an, because we have issues here, we can al always divert people to other other facilities. Mm. So we're just using the technology, really, um, and watching on a daily basis what the guidance is from central government and what legislation is there and what activity, the, from a prepare, preparing, planning point of view, uh, the force needs to be involved in. And that, that structure works under what's referred to as the Local Resilience Forum. So the local resilience forum is um, chaired across the across the um, a wider area. So there's a div um, there's a, a, a county based local resilience forum that works then with public health Wales, the health boards, the unitary authorities, mm -hmm. and all of the decisions and and collectively as partner agencies in Wales, working also with Welsh government, decisions would be made as to whether things like schools close or even even sites such as police headquarters or the unitary authority headquarters, they may make a decision at some point for some staff to stay at home yeah. and work remotely if that's possible. And it is possible in this day and age. You know, I, I'm convinced that at least three quarters of my staff could actually work from home, if not if not all of them, to be honest. As long as they got access to a phone line, emails uh, and Skype if needed then, you know, we would just cancel all the meetings and other things. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, when we first met, I asked you some questions. And slightly changed, I wanted to find out what it was like after about three years. Yeah, yeah. So since our last meeting, a couple of years back, um, has your own understanding of the role of the Police and Crime Commission has changed in any way? I think, I think the answer to that would be Yes, in the sense that in any type of role and job, being as I was new into the particular role of police commissioner, albeit had, you know, I've had, I've got 20 years of experience of working within policing and, and lecturing around criminology and, and that subject and, and things. It, it just, the, the, the experience of working in a particular role obviously matures over time. And some of the things that perhaps I thought were important at the beginning of coming in as the commissioner are deemed to be less important uh, and I'm finding myself more involved in other things and an example of that would be um, involved in the buildings and the estate. I didn't realise that the plus the police commissioner had such a an influential role in the physical resources of the organisation so I am ultimately per person you know the personal role of the police and crime commissioner responsible for all the buildings and all the assets that we have and, and the totality of, of the financing of the police police service. And I've spent more of my time involved in estates, buildings, issues, and finance than perhaps I thought I would. So I always describe the role of police commission as a bridge between the community and the police service. 
but actually there is a lot more of the management of the police activity that I'm involved in that perhaps I envisaged I would have been involved in. That's the biggest difference, really.